Tonight, we are in week two of a series that we have entitled, A Matter of Life and Death. Look at somebody next to you and say, that sounds serious. <laughs> it's because it is serious, people. Um, last week, my brother preached, and he talked about Lazarus and how he died. And four days later, Jesus showed up, and he raised Lazarus back to life against all odds. And even though his sisters had kind of lost faith, and, and he preached this message about how God can bring the dead things in your life back to life, even in those moments that you don't have big faith. I think sometimes we think that only when we have great faith or big faith will God move, and, and sometimes God says, I don't move because of you. He says, I move in spite of you, right? And I'm grateful for that, and, and so tonight, I'm, I'm gonna continue in this series. The, the messages won't be super related um, in topic, but um, in the second week of A Matter of Life and Death, I wanna bring to you guys a message that, honestly, I'm pretty passionate about. I've been working on it uh, for a little while now, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna preach it like I feel it. Is that okay? I'm gonna preach tonight. I wanna preach with some passion. Um, I'm gonna give you guys everything I have tonight. And so are you guys here? Are you alive? Are you with me? Are we ready to go? Okay. I know. Has anybody had a long week? It's just been a long week already. It's been crazy. Who's just had a great week? Let's go. Celebrate that. God is good. So anyway, uh, tonight I wanna bring you guys a message that I've entitled, Live Full, Die Empty. Live Full, Die Empty. And as you're finishing writing that down in your notes, if you are taking notes, I'll go ahead and pray. God, we are uh, so grateful to be here gathered together tonight. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would do the unexpected tonight. Lord, I pray that you would do the unexpected with this message. I, I ask that my words right now would be yours. And I pray that every word that comes out, every word that is from the Bible, that is from Scripture, that it would not fall on deaf ears. But God, it would sink deep into our hearts. Let it change us. Let it form us. Let it shape us, God, and we believe you for these things. And also, God, we just pray for favor for the Dallas Cowboys this season. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said together, boo, wow, <laughs> that's a first. Everyone said, boo, okay. You know what I was thinking? I'm honestly, I'm gonna be real with you, I'm having ADD tonight, it's gonna be fun. So, um, you may not, we say amen, let's say amen together, say amen. Because some of y'all booed instead of amen, but okay. Um, I was like, God's not gonna honor that. Um, do you know what amen means? It literally means, so be it. So when you say amen, you're saying, I agree with what's being said. Not the Dallas Cowboys part. I'm gonna go to the next part. But like, you're, you're literally saying amen. You're saying, so be it. I agree with what they're saying. So when you hear somebody mid-sermon, they're like, amen. They're saying, so be it. I agree with that. I want that for my life. I think that's good. And I just thought that was kind of cool. We say it all the time, but I just always wonder how many people have no idea. Like you thought that was just like what you say at the end of a sermon. But anyway, I digress, as you can tell. Um, how many of you guys are people that when you do something wrong or you do something stupid or you mess up, where, where are my people that love a good do-over? Or is anybody in here like you love a good do-over when you do something dumb, right? Not all of you. How many of you guys hate people that take do-overs? Like you just don't like them. Okay, you got a few. I am like the do-over king. And um, this summer I kind of picked back up into um, golf with a group of guys in the church. And um, what I love most about this group of guys is that we're kind of a do-over kind of group. Uh, we're like a mulligan kind of crew. And so we'll like, we'll swing, we'll drive and hit the ball and it goes 300 yards that way. You know, like complete wrong direction. And we're just like, mulligan. And we're like, yeah, you go for it, bro. Like we have literally gotten to the point, or I have at least, where I will golf with like four or five or six golf balls in my pockets because I know I'm gonna hit a bad shot and I'm just gonna throw a next ball down and I'm gonna hit till I like what I got. You know what I mean? I love a good mulligan. I love a good redo, because um, I got a wicked slice right now, and it's not great. And I love the mulligans. And I just want to give a quick disclaimer. If you live in Tana Juan, um, I have hit your home with a golf ball. It's for sure happened. But I would rather you not send your emails to me, because I didn't build your house there. You can send that email to your association. Um, but I, we're, just, we're just smacking houses left and right, and just like running. Like I don't know whose responsibility it is. Not ours, apparently. Um, but I love a good do-over, and, and it's, it's interesting because in life, we, we get do-overs, if you notice, um, and, and they're allowed typically with things that don't have great significance or consequence. And so, like, if you're in a friendly game of golf, you can, do, you can have some do-overs. If you're playing video games, you can have some do-overs. If you're painting on one of your eyebrows and you mess up, wash it off, do-over, okay? I was just going for it. I'm trying to relate to the women. I don't know what to say. I don't know. I've lived with one for seven years now. I still don't know what to talk about. Um, she always tells me that. She's like, you talk about sports a lot. I'm like, I don't, what else is there? I'm not sure. Okay. 
But with the easy stuff, it's like do over, right? If you need it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but with the more serious and more significant things in your life, like we don't really get do overs. Like if at work, if you do like a whole no call, no show thing, some jobs like you're done. You walk back in, you could be crying and all this stuff, like I overslept, and they're like, obviously, you know, like you're not, you're probably not gonna get a do over. I've, I've been around um, men my age and men, you know, 15, 20 years older than me that have done some really stupid things and literally blew up their marriage and they were desperate for a do-over that was probably never gonna come, right? We don't typically get do-overs with significant things. There's some Broncos fans in here that like, your team would probably love a do-over of the Super Bowl against the Seahawks, right? Like, if, if you could, sorry, that's a low blow, but like, in the things that matter, we don't get do-overs. And what I'm getting at is this tonight, that when it comes to the most significant thing that we have, which is our life, Guys, we don't get a do-over. We, we've got one shot. You know, when I was um, 14 years old, I preached my first sermon ever. And, and just to take a breath, like it wasn't in front of like a real audience. It was in a, a competition called Fine Arts. It was a category called Short Sermon, five minutes long. And I remember what my sermon was. It was entitled, One Life, One Chance. And at 14 years old, like, I went off. Like, I just went in on people. These, like, 40-year-old dudes that were balding. I was like, bro, you got one shot, man. What are you even doing with it? You know, like, just coming at them. I, I started my whole sermon with a countdown. I was like, five, the countdown begins. Four, the clock is ticking. And they're like, what's going to happen at zero, buddy? Like, I don't, <laughs> it was super dramatic. And I just went for it. But I had passion, right? And I was going in and, and I was talking about how we're Christ's ambassadors and we're meant to make a difference and an impact. And, and there are people that are dying that we're not reaching. And, and it's stuff that was true when I was 14 and it's still true today. We've got one life. You've got one chance at what God has placed you on this earth to do. And I'm not negating eternity and heaven. Obviously, we're headed that direction. But for the things that God has called you to do here, the things that God is asking you to do that would make this world a better place, and so more people could come into a relationship with Jesus. You've got one life, and you've got one chance to do something with it. And so, so what I want to argue tonight is that with that in mind, we need to live full, but we also need to make sure that we die empty. Otherwise, it will all have been for naught. It'll be a waste when you get to the end. You know, I don't know about you guys, but honestly, I want to live filled up. I want to live my life full of the Holy Spirit. I wanna live full of the things of God. I wanna live full of grace so I can give it to other people. I wanna live full of the love of God so I can love people the way that he does. I wanna be full of ideas. I wanna be full of, of wisdom. I wanna be filled. I wanna be full of the things of God, but at the same time, I want you to know this, that when I die, I want to die empty, completely empty. I wanna be able to say that I gave literally everything in my life. I want to be able to say that I used every gift that God gave me. I did not take the gifts that God gave and leave them wrapped up or sitting in the corner, but I used them until they were unusable. I used everything. I want to be able to say that I loved with every ounce possible, that I sacrificed my time, my money, my energy. I want to die. Honestly, this may sound weird, but I want to die tired and weary and exhausted, spent and empty. And not because life got the best of me, but because I got the best of life. And understand me when I say this, that getting the best out of life isn't what you can get out of it, it's what you can give to it. I wanna give so much to this life. I'm desperate to give so much to the people that I'm connected to. I'm desperate to give so much to, to this ministry, to Wake, that I've been running for the last eight years, that when I get to the end, it's like I've just got nothing left to give because I gave it all away. I want to die empty. So the questions tonight are how do, we, how do we live full and what does it even mean to die empty? And I think it's important that we answer these questions because I think that there's a lot of people walking on this earth right now and who have gone before us that did the exact opposite. They didn't live full and die empty, but they rather lived empty and they died full. They lived empty of things that actually mattered and had an eternal significance, and they died full of the potential and the giftings that God placed inside of them that were meant to be used for this world. And I don't want that to be you. I want you to be somebody that says, I'm going to give everything that I have. I'm going to get everything I can from God so I can give as much of it away as I can. 
And I think this is one of the greatest tragedies in our human existence. And so tonight, as I, as I jump into the meat of the message tonight, this is honestly one of the more simple in a format sermons I've ever put together. I have two, two main ideas, two points that I've actually just taken from the title. So if you're taking notes tonight, I wanna first talk about the idea of living full. So number one is live full. Humor me if you guys would, everybody with some force and some gusto say, live full. Thank you, that was great. So live full. What does it mean? And I would, I would imagine and I would assume that everybody in this room wants this, right? And it's dangerous to make assumptions, but I, I would assume that Everybody in here, at least on some level, wants to live a fulfilled life. You want to have a life that feels filled up, like, like you have the things that matter, like, you, like you're making an, a difference and you actually have some significance in this world. But, but here's the thing. When it comes to fulfillment, I think one of the greatest temptations that we're going to face in this life is to look for fulfillment in the things that are offered by this world, or let me word it like this. The temptation is gonna be to look for fulfillment in the things that are, are not capable of actually giving it. Because that's what the world is. It's stuff that looks great. It's the stuff that we chase. It's the stuff that the, our society and the world is telling you that you need and telling you to pursue. But when it comes down to it, those are not things that can actually provide fulfillment in your life. You know, one of the greatest examples I can think of in all of the Bible of this idea of where can we actually find real fulfillment in this life? I think it comes from uh, a guy named Solomon in the Old Testament. And now Solomon is uh, an interesting guy, and, and I'll give you a quick backstory if you don't know much about him. Um, if you guys know, do you guys know who David is in the Bible? Like David and Goliath, right? Okay, we'll start there. Solomon is David's son. So he's David, uh, David's his dad, and, and he's the heir to the throne. So when David dies, Solomon becomes the king. We then realize and learn through scripture that Solomon is wealthy like the guy he's got a lot of money he has all the cattle he's got the gold he's got the silver he's got the palace the kingdom he's actually one of the wealthiest men alive on the planet in that day and age like other check this out other kings and queens would would travel just to come look at how wealthy solomon was They're like bro i heard just let me see it just show me the stuff show me the money right and so they would come to see it so he's a king he's wealthy he's also Though he's also super wise. One of the um, you know, more well-known parts of Solomon's life is at one point God speaks to him and he says, Solomon, I will give you in this moment, I have, you have favor in my sight, I will give you whatever you ask for. Some of us are like, that would be just incredible, right? He says, I'll give you whatever you ask for. And Solomon wisely asks for wisdom. He says, I just want more knowledge, I want more understanding. And I love his heart behind it. He wanted wisdom so he, could, he would be better at helping solve the problems in the kingdom and of, the, of his people. And so God grants him wisdom. And so we also see in scripture that Solomon was perhaps the wisest man who ever lived. I remember I preached this on a Sunday one time. Um, I was talking about Proverbs and, and all the wisdom. And I said, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And I had this lady, this like middle-aged woman come up to me after the service. And she's like, excuse me. And I was like, no, gosh, okay, what? She was like, um... Jesus was actually the wisest man who ever lived. Just wanted you to know that, just to correct you. So I just punched her. I just said, like, right there. No, I'm kidding. I didn't. I wouldn't do that. But I was like, obviously. So let me just clarify real quick. Jesus was the wisest man who ever lived, okay? Solomon, second place. Okay, so Solomon's super wise. So he's, he's the king. He's wealthy. He's wise. How many of you would say that it seems like Solomon's a guy that's got it going on? Like, he's got a lot. He's got it going on. He's got everything that somebody would need. But what's interesting is as you, as you open the book of Ecclesiastes, if you've ever read this and you go to like the first book and you start reading, you're like, wow, this is uh, what happened to Solomon. What we see in Ecclesiastes is that Solomon is now an older man and he's taking a moment, you can tell by what he's writing, and he's taking inventory of everything that he has in life. And, and he's, he's having this like, this existential crisis moment where he's looking at his stuff and just going like, what does any of this even mean? What, does this stuff have purpose? Have you ever had that moment, like mid paper, you're writing like a philosophy paper and you just step back and you're like, what am I even doing? Why am I writing this? Why am I in school? Why do I live here? Why am I alive? You know, like we go to this, this drastic level. And this is what Solomon's doing in his old age. In Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, he's looking at his stuff and he's like, he's looking at his money and he's like, it's meaningless. He's looking outside of his cows. He's like, they're meaningless. And everything around him, he's like utterly meaningless. 
everything is, this is like the most depressing part of the whole Bible, I'm sorry, but everything is meaningless. He says, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? And then we jump to chapter two and he said, he's still trying to find fulfillment and meaning. And he says this, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. So he's like, let me just try pleasure. Maybe pleasure will give me meaning. And he said, but that also proved to be meaningless. Then we go to verse four and he says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks. Like he's trying out the whole all, like parks and rec situation. He's, he planted all kinds of uh, fruit trees in them. He's like, I made reservoirs of water groves to flour, uh, flourishing trees. I bought male and female servants. I had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. So I mean, he's just like, like rattling this off. He's like, I amassed silver and gold for myself, the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well. I don't know what a harem is. This is really funny this morning. The word harem had a little footnote in my Bible. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna find out what it means. And I went down and was like, we don't know what harem means. I was like, appreciate it, Bible. Okay, so harem is well, they, the delights of a man's heart. He said, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart, no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. And I read that and I honestly have to step back for a moment because we're looking at a guy who was wealthy and had everything. He's like, I have the money, but it's not what you think it is. Are you like me? And like whenever somebody that's really wealthy is complaining about having money, you're like, I'll give it a shot, you know, like, like you obviously suck with money. So like I, but he's, this is wealthy man. He's got the wisdom. He's got everything. And he's like, I, I look at it. Everything I worked so hard for, the things I toiled for, and because I did them for myself and not for God, and because I, I used these to find fulfillment instead of first going to God for my fulfillment, it all, it, it's all meaningless. He said, I literally gained everything, yet somehow I came up empty. And it's such a huge word of caution for us tonight that as, as young people, to be careful not to begin your life pursuing things that are never gonna bring what you want them to bring. To not start in life early in a trajectory in a path that's not gonna take you ultimately where you wanna go. So to live full, what Solomon ends up getting at, he's like, if you wanna live full, it's not gonna come through things or prestige or money or power or relationships. He's helping us realize that fulfillment is found only in God. That's it, that's it. That was a great place to clap. You totally missed it. Totally, no, it's, it's too late now, it's awkward. Okay, so, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so he said, told you I feel weird tonight, but he said, it's not found in these things, it's found in God. And I think what Solomon would add in his moment of crisis is he would say, and don't wait till you're old to figure that out. Don't wait till you're toward the end of your life to figure out that all the things you were doing weren't worth your life and what you were giving to it. You know, I think tonight, when it comes to this moment, this is what I've been praying for, and what I've been praying for us is that this would, right now, that we would have a moment of realization, a moment of realization now so we can avoid this same moment of regret later. I don't want you to have the same moment that Solomon had. So I've been praying that God will let you realize now what is actually worth putting my effort, my time, and my investment in this life into so that we don't end up going the wrong way. You know, when I was uh, uh, 18 years old, I went out to college um, just south of Dallas, Texas, Waxahachie, Texas. I doubt you've ever been there. And, um, so I went out to school, my parents drove me out. At the end of the semester, I was driving home. And so this was the first time that I was ever doing the drive from Dallas back to Albuquerque by myself. And I ended up having a sweet mate from Albuquerque. And he was like, bro, can I bum a ride? I was like, sure, if you pay for the gas, right? Like you gotta, you gotta get your money. So he jumps in the car and we start heading toward Albuquerque. And we decide to stop in Amarillo, like six and a half hour drive in. And um, my, my grandma and grandpa were living there at the time. So we show up in Amarillo late at night, we pull up and, and we walk in 
And guys, I have a good and loving grandma. Like she had just dinner, just this whole kitchen table was just spread. There's like pumpkin pie, not even close to Thanksgiving, but like we're just rolling with it. And, and um, I mean, she's just knocking it out, doing what a good grandma does. And so we eat, my friend goes to bed, I hang out with my grandma and grandpa. So we wake up early the next morning and we're about to leave. And my grandma says, hey, you gotta go hit up Donut Stop, like on your way out, go get some coffee and some donuts and uh, then hit the road. And so we go and, and we have to like cross over the interstate, take a few turns, we go to Donut Stop, we get our coffee, we get our donuts, and then we hit the road. We just hop on the interstate, we're taking off, we're like eating our donuts, we're fixing the music dials, and we're like, we're off the open road, and we're like, Albuquerque, let's go, you know, and, and we're headed there, we're going. And as we're going, we're like an hour into the drive, and I look over at my friend and I'm like, bro, New Mexico's weird, man, because like, we, we're not original. Like, we are, we've been naming some of our towns the same names as some of these towns in Texas. Like, this is awkward. Like, why would we do that? And I'm like, railing on New Mexico. I'm like, man, it's like, that's just the most New Mexico thing ever to copy all of Texas city names. And, and so we're going, and, and all of a sudden, we reach this town called Vernon. And um, now Vernon has this big Brahms. Have you ever been to Brahms before? And we got, like, some shakes at Brahms on the way in. And so we, we reached Vernon, and all of a sudden, I had this realization that we were not in Vernon, New Mexico, but we were in Vernon, Texas. And we had actually driven two hours in the wrong direction. Why? Because we were 18 and stupid, okay? And drove the wrong direction, right? Because we drove in at night, it was daytime, and I'm like, I thought we had some mountains in our state, but whatever, like we're just gonna keep going. And, and in that moment, we were like, oh my gosh, what should have taken four hours is now gonna be an eight hour drive. And, and here's the deal, we just went out in the wrong direction. And I wanna say this, if, if you get to Vernon, Texas, and you realize you drove a couple hours in the wrong way, it's kind of irritating. But if you go to the end of your life and realize you were driving the wrong way, it's kind of irreversible. And so it doesn't really, the consequence isn't huge when you're 18 and you're driving home. The consequence is far greater when it's dealing with your life and you get to 50, 60, 70, 80 years old and look back and realize I was putting my heart in the wrong things the entire time. I wanted to live full and so I went after the things of the world only to come up empty every single time. We gotta make sure we're headed in the right way to find that fulfillment and that filling. You know, studying for this message, I was doing some reading and I came across a, a study recently that was done and, and what they found in the study was um, they concluded that there's six psychological needs for human beings to feel fulfilled. Can I wanna share these with you guys? Six psychological needs for human beings to feel Fulfilled in, in tech team, you guys can leave this up for a while. So number one is, is certainty. You want fulfillment, you need some certainty, some constant, some uh, consistency in your life. We wanna know where we're going, what we're doing. Uh, we also need a little bit of uncertainty, right? Variety in life, uh, you wanna shake things up a little bit. We also want significance. You know, we wanna feel like we matter, what we're doing makes a difference. Uh, we want love and connection. You wanna feel loved by people, connected to people. We want growth. So some of us, we go to, um, you know, we read leadership books. We watch TED Talks like crazy just to regurgitate information that we don't really know to try to sound smart. Um, we, contribution. We want to find a way that we can contribute to this world. Do we fit into this society? Do we make a difference? Can I contribute financially to this? And, and if you the tech team, you leave this up. I just wanted to, I wanted to point something out to you just for a moment. That when it comes to, these are what they've concluded are the six uh, needs, psychological needs for human beings to feel fulfilled. I wanted to point something out, that when, it, when I read my Bible and when I learn more about God, what I have come to conclude is that these needs have already been met by our God. And so we have a choice. We can either spend our life trying to meet our own needs or we can just trust that God has already met or is currently meeting these needs right now. Let me tell you what I mean. So we need certainty, right? Um, certainty really is the one thing we can't have. You heard the quote, the one thing I'm certain about in life is that nothing is certain. So we want it. So we grip onto the steering wheel of, of life. We white knuckle it and we try to control and direct and, and it's an illusion of certainty. But what I love is, is Paul in Romans 8, 38. He says something pretty profound. He says, you know, there is actually one thing that I am certain about and what I'm certain of is that when it comes to the love of God, there's no height or depth 
or angel or demon or anything in the past or the future or anything in all creation that could ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you want certainty? You can be certain that God loves you. And if God loves you, that means he's got a plan for you. That means he's with you. He's guiding you. That's the certainty we have. You're, we need uncertainty, variety. I think it's funny that those are back to back, right? Uncertainty and variety. Let me just ask you this. If, if you're somebody that thinks that following Jesus or being a Christian is kind of a boring or dull life, then I would, I would ask you, have you ever for a day in your life allowed yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit? Because if you want some uncertainty and variety in your life, then walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Pray something like, Holy Spirit, guide me today. Take me where you wanna take me. Show me people that you wanna show me. Uh, put people in my path. Give me opportunities. And I promise you, you will begin to live a life of variety and uncertainty. I love Paul. He said um, he was headed to Jerusalem. And he's like, the Holy Spirit's taking me there, but the only thing that I know is that like, I have no idea what's gonna happen. He's leading me into uncertainty. And so when you're following the Holy Spirit, you are following him into certain uncertainty. But it's a great place to be. We need significance. Okay, let me ask you this question. If you want significance in life, you wanna feel like, like you're important and what you do matters. Can I ask you this question? Is there anything more significant than being a part of God's plan to add more people into the family of God? Is there anything more significant, right? He says, I'm choosing you and I'm calling you. I told you to go. I've called you to be my ambassadors. If you want significance, then just do what Jesus asked you to do. Go help add people into the family of God. You want love and connection. First John 4 says that God is love. You want more love, then get more God. He is love. You want connection? Paul says that the church, the people who gather, that we are a body, one body, unified, every part different, every part unique, every part has a purpose. And he said when one part is missing, the entire body notices and feels it, right? Because we're not operating at full capacity. Then he says if one part of the body is hurting, then the entire body hurts. And we know this to be true even in the smallest, most insignificant way, like the, your, your pinky toe that doesn't even belong in your body. Have you ever stubbed it before? Middle of the night, just smacked it on the side of the door? What happens? You fall to the ground, you beg for God to take you in that moment. <laughs> Kill me, God. I choose death, right? Like one tiny part of your body and the rest of your body feels it. Can I just tell you, that's what the church is. When we're connected and when we're unified, your pain is my pain. And I should be so connected to you that I should know when you're in pain. I should know when you're struggling. I should know when you're, when you're not here. But people aren't gonna know your pain and know that you're not around if you never get connected. So God said, I know you need love and connection. It's one of the basic needs. But I've, I've given you my love and I've given you the greatest avenue for connection in human history and it is called the church. Don't attend church, be the church. Get connected into it. Get into a group, get to know people. He says, you want growth. What I love about scripture is, is most of the language of the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, is a language of agriculture, right? All they talk about is like seed, seed everywhere. You know, it's like the seed of the gospel, a seed of, of knowledge. Anytime we open the word, it's like, it's like the seed being planted inside of us. And he said, we take those seeds, we water them, God makes them grow. We produce more fruit, and guess what happens when you have fruit? You have more seed. He says, repeat the cycle. You wanna grow? Man, lean into the things of God. Be here. Listen to messages, worship, dive into your own word. You, you wanna contribute? Here's what I love about God. I know that we have such a need to feel like we are contributing to what's happening in this world. And God, this is what's so cool about our God. He didn't just say, hey, humans, I love you guys. You know, I created you, you messed up, I sent Jesus, you're saved, now just sit here and watch me do what I do. No, God said, I'm gonna invite you to be a part of my plan of redemption. And so I'm gonna gift you so you can use those for the world. I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna give you a purpose and an anointing so you can contribute and be a part of what I'm trying to do. Man, God met all these already. We don't have to fight for these things. We don't have to strive for these things. We just trust that God has already met these needs. If you're with him, fulfillment is already there. And so live full. And what I mean by live full is, is begin right now in this moment. Take inventory. Could you for a second? Could we have a moment of reflection? Could you take inventory in your mind and in your heart? 
What are some of the things in your life right now that if you were honest, you have been pursuing and you have been thinking that if you could get that thing, if you could get that relationship, if you could get that raise or into that school, that that would bring you fulfillment. And I think right now, I know this sounds weird, but right now, even as I'm talking, I think we need to begin to repent and say, God, I'm sorry that I put that ahead of you, that I for a second ever believed that something other than you would actually bring fulfillment in my life. Nothing brings fulfillment, true fulfillment, other than God. And so if you want to live filled up, lean into God, lean toward God and out of the things of this world, but we've got to live full, number one. So number two, we can die empty. I want us to die empty. Like I was saying a moment ago, I want to get to that point at the end of my life. And that's the hard part. I say that a lot. Every time I say the end of my life, I'm like 100, I'm dying in a bed. You know what I mean? Like, I imagine it being this like great moment, but like, I don't know when the end of my life is. None of us do, right? And so we either can live in a way that goes the end of my life 50 years from now, or you can live with a greater understanding that says the end of my life could be tonight. And so to, to live like this doesn't mean we live like it later. It means we live like this right now. I'm gonna begin the process of, of dying empty so that if it was tonight, if it was weeks from now, months from now, or 50 years from now, I can still die completely empty. I'm gonna invite the band to come back and join me. And you know, where this concept came from, I was doing some reading a while back. And um, I was reading this story about a young man who went to South Africa and he's talking to this, this older man. He gets in this conversation, with, he's out doing some ministry work and he gets in this conversation with this, this older man that's just like wise, full of so much wisdom and he's just soaking it all in everything he's saying. This wise man then pauses for a moment, just dead silence for a good like 20 seconds. He just looks at the guy and the young man was like, I could tell this guy's wheels were spinning. Like he was about to say something profound, ask me some cra crazy question. And the old man looked at him and he, and he asked him this question. He said, kind of a weird, bizarre, out of left field question. And he said, can I ask you something? Um, what would you say is the most valuable land in the world? What's the most valuable land in the world? And the guy was like, it's an odd question, but he said, I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. So he's like, I, um, he thought about like areas of Paris that are like super expensive. And he, then he started thinking more and he thought, well, maybe it's like the, the diamond mines in Africa. He's like, maybe it's the, the oil fields of the Middle East, right? Two good, pretty good guesses. And he said, as soon as he gave those answers, those responses, he said, the old man immediately shook his head. And he said, he said, no, those aren't the most valuable. He said, the most valuable land in the world is found in our graveyards. Because buried just six feet under the surface are billions of unfulfilled dreams, prom problems that were never solved, cures that could have been discovered but never were, books that were never written, songs that were never composed, gifts that were never realized, sermons that were never preached, and help that was never given. And he said that ground is so valuable because so many people die with so much yet to give. He said, so anytime you're in a graveyard or a cemetery, look around for a moment and he said, you'll almost be brought to tears by thinking about all of the things that were never brought out of those people, all of the things that were never realized. And the whole time God had these people and he said, I have given you gifts and they're not there just to sit there and look beautiful. They're not there just for you, but I've given you gifts so that you can help reach this world. He said, man, I've, I've given you forgiveness, not just so that you can sit there and be forgiven, but so that you can go and you can give the same forgiveness that I gave to you. I didn't just give you grace to cover your sin, I gave you grace so you could show it to other people. I didn't just give you some joy so you could be happy and you could be joyful, I gave you joy so that you could go find people that need joy. Go be contagious to them. Show people. There's so many people that die with gas still left in the tank. There's much to be realized, much to be recognized in their life. And, and I wanna just sidestep for a moment. I wasn't necessarily planning on saying this, but this, this sermon honestly popped in my head eight days ago. I was preaching at our youth ministry and I was talking about a guy in the Bible named Samson. I don't know if you've heard of Samson before, but Samson, he was created by God 
and called by God to make a huge difference for the people of God. And God said, look, Samson, I've given you a unique set of skills. I've given you, he gave him supernatural strength. He gave him a mission. But the problem with Samson is he knew his calling. He knew his responsibility. But rather than follow his purpose, what I was telling our teenagers is that Samson just played around with his purpose. He just fooled around with it. He never took it seriously. And so rather than pursuing God, he pursued women. Rather than using his gift to help the people of God, he used his gift to bring him glory and to bring him fame and to get his own agenda fulfilled. And so his entire life, Samson takes the call of God, the gifts of God, the anointing of God, the plan, all these things, and he never uses it for God, he uses it for himself. Later, Samson finds himself in a place of weakness. His power has left him. And God, ultimately, at the end of his story, God redeems. I, I don't know if you know the story, but God redeems him. God gives him his power back. And as he stands between these two pillars with his enemy out in front of him, God gives him the strength to pull these pillars in, and the entire temple comes crashing down. And Samson has a great victory. And scripture even notes, it says, Samson killed more of the enemies of Israel in that moment than in, in his entire life. So it's a great moment, a great victory at the end of his life. But I just can't help but, but think, how much did Samson leave in the tank? Yeah, he had a victory in the end. He had a moment at the very end where he finally looked back to God. But how much gas was left in the tank? How much of Samson's life was still left out on the table? And what kinds of things could he have done and accomplished if he had not used his gifts for himself? If he had not been so caught up in pursuing pleasure in the things of this world, but rather pursuing God. Man, he would have done far better things. He would have done far greater things. So I'm not telling you if, if you get to the end of your life and have the realization that God can't redeem you and God can't restore you. But I am telling you that you will not die empty. You will still die with much of the things that God was telling you that he wanted you to give to this world. Guys, we're not here after we're saved, just to attend church and lift our hands and sing some songs. We are here to be a part of God's cosmic plan of redemption for humanity. And he says, go, use everything I gave you. I'm gonna close with this, Paul writes in Philippians 2, 17. He says, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. Look what he says, he says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. And I know you may not know what that is or what that means, but basically a drink, drink offering was this, okay, real fast, what I'll tell you. They would go to the altar where they would make sacrifices for their sins, where they would, they would kill, have to kill an animal. Sometimes people would also um, bring offerings. They would bring their produce, their best produce, a percentage, and, and put it on the altar, giving their best to God. So forgiveness of sins, giving God their best. But a drink offering was kind of different. It was kind of unique. They would basically walk up with a cup of wine, and they would then take the wine and pour it out over the altar. I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, how could you? No, but like he would take the wine, pour it out over the altar. And, and here's the interesting thing about a drink offering you would make sure that you poured every drop of it out. And it was symbolic. It would say this to God, God, I know that you created me and you gave me everything that I have. And so God, I'm gonna give you everything that I have. I'm gonna give you everything that I am. And it's a beautiful thing that they would do. It was so symbolic. But I love what Paul says. He, he takes it to the context of the Philippian church and this, this young, th uh, thriving church that he loved deeply. He goes to them and he says, guys, I poured myself out like a drink offering for you. For, first and foremost for God, but also for you. I gave you everything, the, every word God told me to write, I wrote it down for you. Every prayer he asked me to pray, I prayed it for you. Every ounce of money he asked me to give, I gave it to you. I poured myself out for you, because I know that everything God gave me and everything I am it was never meant to stay in my cup. It was never meant to stay with me, but it was always meant to be poured out for his glory and for his purposes so I could build the church, so I could help save this world, so people could know the grace and the love of Jesus.
And I just want to know tonight if there's anybody in here who would say, I want, I'll, I'll do that. I want to be like Paul. I want, to, I want to live full, so filled up of the things of God. But every single day, when I lay down in bed at night, I want to be so completely empty because I poured out all day long. I gave all day. I served. I gave my money. I gave my time. I gave my energy. I gave forgiveness. I gave wisdom. I gave my ideas. Whatever God has given me, I will give back to this world. Guys, if we want to see Albuquerque change, if we want to see our nation change, if we want to see this world change, it's going to require Christians that stop living with their cup filled up and just saying, this is great. I love that God filled me up. I love that I have God. I feel like too many Christians are doing that. And it's Christians that will say, you know what? I'll pour it out. Everything I am, I will pour it out for your purposes, Lord.